Commissioner Johnson and I are here today to provide everyone an update on the COVID-19 situation across the state for today, Tuesday, June 9th, 2020. We begin today's briefing on a sad note for the entire state of Maine. Today, we mark the passing of the 100th individual with coronavirus across the state. She was a woman in her 90s from Cumberland County. This now marks 100 individuals across the state of Maine who have passed away with coronavirus since our first recorded case here in the state in March. It also marks 100 individual families who are grieving the losses of their loved ones across the state right now. We not only offer them our deepest condolences during this time of grief, but I also ask everyone to bear in mind that each and every single case, each and every statistic we talk about, behind those numbers lies an individual person. In many instances, those are individuals who have been severely injured or harmed, or in, in many cases who have passed away because of coronavirus. As we always do, we keep them in our thoughts. And for those who are still grappling with the virus, we offer them nothing but the best in terms of their recovery and their health. Overall, Maine CDC is now recording 2,606 cases of COVID-19 across the state, representing an increase of 18 cases since yesterday. The breakdown of those cases comprised 2,322 confirmed cases and 284 probable cases. Overall, 302 individuals have been hospitalized at some point during their coronavirus illness, and currently there are 29 individuals in hospital right now. Of those 29, 10 are in the intensive care unit and seven remain on ventilators. As I mentioned a moment ago, there have now been 100 individuals who have passed away with COVID-19 across the state. Overall, 1,992 individuals have recovered, an increase of 101 recoveries since yesterday. I'd like to pause on that for a moment. The significant increase in the number of individuals who have recovered is partly a function of some large outbreaks that occurred a few weeks ago where individuals who were affected have now moved on through the recovery phase. It's also a function of our process of going through data, making sure it's accurate. But much of what we're seeing in this large number of increased recoveries is the fact that in the not too recent past, there were a large number of outbreaks across the state. And as individuals have grappled with coronavirus and have come out successfully on the other side, they're now marked as recovered. Overall, since beginning our work on COVID-19, Maine CDC staff have fielded 8,575 consults from healthcare workers and members of the public across the state. And of our cases, 639, are among healthcare workers, an increase of four healthcare worker cases since yesterday. I'd like to take a moment now to provide updates on some of the outbreaks, new as well as existing, that Maine CDC has been involved with over the past several weeks. First, an update on some of the existing outbreaks in, where, in which Maine CDC has, has been most active. There's been other news recently, and so I haven't provided an update on the outbreak situation, so I'd like to catch everyone up on that front today. The first is that at Cape Memory Care, there continue to be 84 total cases of COVID-19 associated with that facility, both among staff and residents. At Eldridge Lumber, there continue to be 13 cases of COVID-19 associated with that workplace. And at the Procter & Gamble facility, in the Lewiston Auburn area, there continue to be a total of seven cases of COVID-19 associated with that manufacturing facility. I'd also like to report on, on uh, now five new outbreaks, three of which are in healthcare settings and two of which are in workplace settings. 
We'll first start with the healthcare related outbreaks. At Montello Manor Rehab Center in Lewiston, Maine CDC has recently opened an outbreak investigation after recording three cases associated with that facility. Next, at Serenity Residential Care in Gorham, similarly, Maine CDC has opened an outbreak investigation after recording five cases of COVID-19 associated with that facility. And finally, at Support Solutions in the Lewiston Auburn area, we have likewise opened an investigation after re uh, receiving confirmed reports of four cases associated with that facility. I'd also, I'd also like to report on two workplace related outbreaks. The first is at Abbott Laboratories and their facility in Scarborough. Maine CDC is now aware of approximately, or of, is aware of 23 cases among approximately 600 Abbott employees. These are cases that Abbott started identifying in mid-April. Abbott, it is important to note, has been proactively testing its employees every single week starting in mid-April. And as we've talked about at length during these meetings, at, when you go out and look for things in public health, you find them. We commend our colleagues at Abbott for taking this early proactive step toward testing each and every one of their employees now going on almost two months. On top of that, however, since May 31st, there have been five cases that have been associated with the Abbott facility, which raises our, uh, our flag in order to prompt us to open up an outbreak investigation. Abbott is continuing its process and protocol of testing not only all full-time employees, but as well they are now testing co um, contracted construction workers who have spent time on their campus. In addition to that, Abbott is also adhering to all of the best practices in public health, including social distancing, furnishing PPE for all of their employees, and undertaking their own contact tracing to make sure that any individual who has been identified as being positive is provided the most up-to-date public health guidance. We are continuing to work with our colleagues at Abbott to try to identify A, whether the workplace is the site of the outbreak, and B, what other additional steps, if any, might be able to be implemented. But it's worth noting again that Abbott was one of the first, if not the first workplace in Maine to institute weekly testing. And, and as a result of that, as we've said, when you go looking for things in public health, you do find them. The other outbreak I would like to report on is also at a workplace, which is at the Nichols Manufacturing Facility in Portland, where, where Maine CDC is aware of a total of seven cases associated with that factory. Similarly, as to Abbott, we are working with the management of that organization to make sure that their employees have all the PPE that they need, that physical distancing within the facility can be maintained, and that any outstanding questions that they have, be it around universal testing or around best infection control practices are answered. I will continue to provide updates on both of those situations as they evolve over the coming days. I'd like to turn next to provide an update on some of our public health preparedness activities and catch everyone up on where things stand there. Let's first talk about one of the most critical pieces of the overall testing architecture, which is the deployment of swabs and viral transport media across the state. Maine CDC has fulfilled now almost 140 orders from healthcare providers across the state for swabs and viral transport media. Collectively, we have shipped out 60,000 pieces of swabs and viral transport media to those healthcare providers across the state and are continuing to do so as requests for resources come in. I'd next like to turn to the work that our colleagues are doing at the National Guard to, uh, to undertake fit testing missions at healthcare facilities across the state. As of this morning, our colleagues at the Guard have completed 71 fit testing missions at healthcare facilities statewide. Overall, they have tested close to 2,000, I'm sorry, not tested, fit tested, close to 2,000 healthcare workers at facilities across the state. 
As a reminder, this now means that there are 2,000 additional healthcare workers that were not fit tested who can now take advantage of the life-saving properties of N95 masks in order for them to stay on their jobs, keep providing healthcare to Maine people, and simultaneously stay safe themselves. But our colleagues at the Guard are not done. They still have approximately 445 individuals who are in the queue, healthcare workers who are waiting for their fit testing as well. I'd like to take a second again to thank the men and women of the National Guard. As, as everyone has heard me talk about, they've been undertaking these fit testing missions across the state for weeks now. And as we've talked about, they have no signs of slowing down. Another thing that's not slowing down is our overall delivery of personal protective equipment across the state. As of this morning, Maine CDC, working with our colleagues at the Department of Transportation, have fulfilled 2,141 orders for personal protective equipment across the state. This PPE, which we've talked about at length, is life-saving, is vital for healthcare workers who are on the front lines to continue coming to their workplaces every day in order to provide health care for Maine people and keep everyone healthy. The bulk of the PPE that we have distributed goes really to two, or, two types of organizations. The first are long-term care facilities, where we've seen a significant number of outbreaks nationwide. The other are to local fire, rescue, and EMS provider organizations in your backyard. Our goal with our PPE work is to provide the PPE to people on the ground, the people you know who work in these facilities who need it the most. Thus far, we've, we've fulfilled 2,141 orders. To put that number in perspective, though, that, that number comprises 1,510,871 pieces of PPE. I'm going to say that again for, to make sure. It's 1,510,871 pieces of PPE that have been distributed to healthcare workers across the state since the beginning of our COVID-19 activation. To put that number in further perspective, that's more than one piece of PPE for every single person in Maine. Similarly, we do not show any signs of taking our feet off the gas. Our public health emergency preparedness team is continuing to fill orders as they come in from healthcare providers across the state. And before I turn things over to questions, just a quick update on our vital medical assets that we track every single day. Overall in Maine, there are 402 ICU beds available, or 402 ICU beds in total. 177 of those beds are available. There are 316 ventilators across the state, 255 of which are available. And there remain available 441 alternative ventilators for healthcare providers to use across the state. The last number I'd like to update on everyone on today is where we stand with respect to our statewide positivity rates. As everyone, is, as everyone who's been tuning in has heard us talk about, the positivity rate is one of the best ways for us to get a sense of whether we are casting a broad enough net when it comes to testing. Overall, just in the past 24 hours in Maine, our point positivity rate, just the positivity rate for the last 24 hours, is 2.78%. The goal, of course, is to get that number as low as possible, and that's the trend that we are trying to push. Cumulatively, across the state of Maine, there have now been a total of 67,874 total tests for COVID-19 that have been conducted. But the number we really focus on when it comes to positivity rates, in order to get a clear sense of where the outbreak currently stands, is the number of those tests that are molecular. That number is 62,873, 62873. That's the number of cumulative tests that have been done across the state. 
Of those, the positivity rate thus far across the state of Maine has continued to fall even further. Today, it stands at 4.73%. Now, as I've said, we've got more work to do before we get to where we're going with respect to positivity rates and testing. But the trend is in our favor. The wind is at our backs. We've just now got to keep rowing so we can keep getting to where we're going. So with that, again, Commissioner Johnson, Commissioner Heather Johnson from DECD has joined us today. And I would like to turn things over to our colleagues in the media. Um, and today's first question goes to Brad Rogers from WGME. Hi, I've got a question for each of you. Um, first, uh, you kind of cut out, was that Montello Manor in Lewiston? Your audio cut out. Yep, sorry about that, Brad. You are correct. That's Montello Manor, Montello Manor in the Lewiston area. And uh, is the state offering universal testing in all of these outbreak, new outbreak locations? That, that is correct, Brad. Pursuant to our policy, we recommend universal testing in each and every one of these situations. It's important to note that Abbott has already been doing that for over two, almost two months now. But as to the other uh, facilities, we recommend universal testing. Facilities can use our laboratory in Augusta, but if they already have a relationship with another commercial laboratory, they're welcome to use that as well. Okay, and for Commissioner Johnson, um, it's my understanding Maine is the only state require that's going requiring visitors to test for COVID-19 as one of the requirements. Uh, given the low numbers, I think we only have a little over 600 active cases right now in the state, and many of them are in these um, uh, outbreak settings. Uh, are we giving visitors a reason to go elsewhere by, by having this extra requirement on there to come to Maine, to, to vacation in Maine? Yeah, so good. Thank you. Um, what we're seeing is most of the northeastern states have some sort of layer um, as it relates to tourism. Generally, it's a 14-day quarantine. Um, and then, as you've seen in Vermont last week, they carved out a couple of areas just like we did that said, those numbers are very similar to their numbers. And so we've we've done that same thing and said, um, New Hampshire and Maine's health outcomes are very similar so that we will carve them out. Um, but really what we've done is create an alternative for visitors. Um, we believe visitors wanna to come to a safe destination and we have created a layered approach so that visitors will feel safe and, and Maine residents will feel safe as we continue to, as we will grow our population right over the summer, we go from 1.3 million with a significant spike um, as we welcome tourists. And we really um, feel strongly about welcoming tourists and tourism and wanted to have um, that economy open as much as possible. So giving people um, some options to what they felt most comfortable with either testing or quarantine um, to allow us to open up the state as much as possible to them. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Brad. Uh, we're gonna turn next to Caitlin Andrews at the BDN. Hi, good afternoon. Um, I also have a qu questions for um, both of you. Uh, Dr. Shaw, I guess I'll go first. On the Abbott Lab um, outbreak, can you kind of just re-explain the timeline of this? I think you mentioned there have been five cases since um, May 31st. How did we get from five to 23? And um, this will probably be a question for the company, but do you know what they are doing to kind of protect the testing materials that they create from possibly being infected with the virus? Sure. Caitlin, as, as you can imagine, that was one of the questions that we raised and wanted to discuss with them as well. They have been taking steps to ensure that the laboratory processes are, are in, uh, maintain the integrity, but as you also noted, that they, they would be able to go into much more detail about that. In terms of the timeline, they had detected occasional cases starting back when they first tested individuals. I'm, I don't have in front of me when the very first case was, but occasional cases had been detected. What we saw in our data was an uptick just, since the, just in the past few days, which meets our threshold for when we've detected an outbreak. Uh, so what they'd seen overall is an occasional series of cases associated with the workplace. But when we saw this uptick of five cases just in the past few days, that triggered us to open the investigation to try to see if there was something more going on. So it sounds like maybe they had a few cases here and there, but never anything that rose to the level of an outbreak until this cluster of cases all at once, which caused you guys to investigate it further. Am I understanding that right? 
You are understanding that correct. And with workplaces, um, as we've talked about with other workplace sites, one of our central questions is whether the workplace itself is the site of transmission or whether given that it's a facility with 600 individuals, there's other people in the community who happen to have it, who happen to work in the same facility. That's one of the first questions that we try to look at when we think about workplace outbreaks as compared to healthcare outbreaks. Okay, thank you. And then my um, my question for Commissioner Johnson, um, states like New York and Massachusetts that typically send a lot of tourists to Maine um, currently aren't offering testing to anybody who wants it. Um, is there any, and I guess I would say this is also open to the commit, um, Dr. Shaw, is there any concern that a flood of visitors from these states could possibly clog up Maine's expanded testing system? And how would you address that? Um, Dr. Shaw, do you wanna take that first and then I can follow in? Yep, sure. So, uh, Caitlin, uh, we, we, we've, we've considered that as we ourselves were going through our decision-making process. Uh, I will note that other states are contemplating moving in the same direction that Maine has already moved in, which is to say offering standing orders, things of that nature. Uh, Maine was, uh, we again, were, were, were ahead of the curve on doing those things, but I understand from talking to my colleagues that other states are looking at doing something similar that would expand the testing availability. But uh, the other thing in those states is that they are setting up their own sort of drive-through swab and send locations, which again would offer people the opportunity to get a test before they come here. Testing may not be as widely available in those states as it is in Maine. Um, so as a result of that, as we've been doing our planning around the swab and send sites, we've tried to take into account making sure that those sites have enough throughput, not just for Maine people, but of course that's our primary goal, but also have enough capacity for any incoming tourist as well. The other thing, Dr. Shaw, if I could just add, the landscape of testing has changed really dramatically, even if you just look at the last 45 days to today, and we expect that acceleration to continue, right? There, there are a lot of things being brought online, so we are, um, we continue to look forward at what the science will bring there as well. Great, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm gonna turn next to Brian Sullivan at WABI. Yeah, I have a question for you, Dr. Shaw, and for the commissioner as well. I guess I'll start with you, Dr. Shaw. If you don't mind just commenting on the uh, what came out of the World Health Organization about asymptomatic transmission on, on Monday, and then they sort of walked it back today, I think maybe there's some confusion about that. And if you could just uh, tell me what I should believe, I suppose. Great. <laughs> um, wow. I, I'm happy to do so, Brian, uh, not just with respect to COVID-19, but perhaps uh, uh, other topics as well. So um, let, let's let's start with what the WHO just, as, as you referenced, Brian, noted this morning, which is that they did walk back a statement that they made, that one of their scientists made yesterday. I, I'm going to leave aside all of the, the, the back and forth with the WHO and just cut right to the chase. Here's the bottom line, and this is actually something we, we talked about at one of our meetings, one of these briefings about a week ago. The difference between asymptomatic transmission and what is really much more common, which is pre-symptomatic transmission. One of the turning points in the COVID-19 epidemic, pandemic, was several months ago, when an emerging, uh, an emerging weight of science emerged that showed that individuals could transmit COVID-19 before they started developing the symptoms. That's actually the main reason why the face covering recommendation started being adopted. Most infectious diseases, you, you typically transmit only after you've developed symptoms. But COVID-19, we found back in March to be unique and you could transmit it before you started having symptoms. That's where the face covering recommendation really emanated from. But the distinction that's at play that you raise in your question, Brian, is one between people who can transmit the disease without ever having shown any symptoms whatsoever versus people that can transmit the disease before they start showing symptoms. What we know is that the bulk of the people who transmit COVID-19 when they don't have symptoms later go on to develop symptoms. Very few people go through their entire course of COVID-19 without showing a single sign or symptom. The majority of folks 
who when they get tested for COVID-19, they may not have any symptoms at the time they get tested, but might test positive. Most of those folks later go on to develop symptoms. The WHO was a bit imprecise in their communication around this, but the bottom line remains, individuals can still transmit COVID-19 even though they don't have any symptoms. And that really underscores why face coverings are so important. It really is a sign of respect for other people in your community when you go out and wear a face covering. It's you acknowledging that you might, there's a chance that you might have COVID-19 and that you might transmit it to somebody even though you feel fine. And to me, it's a sign of respect to other people. Thank you, I believe that. Uh, now for Commissioner Johnson, um, I have a quote here and I'm not sure if you've seen it. It's for, uh, it's from the ACLU of Maine. And have you seen it by chance? I have not seen it. So I'll just read it to you. It's a few sentences. Uh, it says, the idea that all non-Maine residents must carry compliance papers with them and produce them when asked certainly raises concern about government outreach, especially since the consequences for non-compliance are not clear. Beyond that, there is the potential for discriminatory enforcement and unconstitutional stops. Law enforcement could use this policy as a pretense to target people of color if they have out-of-state license plates. I just would ask you to respond to that. Yeah, Brian, I feel like maybe that is better um, referred to to the legal team uh, at this point. So maybe we'll get, if it's possible, we can get your response after the call's over. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Brian. Uh, we're going to turn next to Kate Koff at the Ellsworth American. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Um, so two questions, I guess uh, the first one possibly for both of you. Uh, the first one is this, the draft compliance form that's um, on the state's website seems to indicate, and correct me if I'm wrong, that children are not required to get a test in lieu of quarantine, um, even though it, I, I believe there's evidence that children may transmit the disease asymptomatically or presymptomatically, as you mentioned earlier. Um, so can you just talk about the decision to exempt them from testing requirements? I I think Alaska, which also implemented a testing requirement for travelers in the quarantine, I think Alaska does require children to be able to provide evidence of a negative PCR test. So if you could explain that decision, that would be great. Sure. I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and start, Kate. And then, Commissioner, if you have anything to add on top. Um, so the, the, the uh, reason it was is twofold. The first is that um, it, it, the 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 concept presupposes that children will be traveling with adults. And so the focus is really on testing the adults who are more likely to be carriers, to be pre-symptomatic, um, and, and thus the assumption is that the children, it, because they live, again, presumably in the same household as the adults they're traveling with, we wanted to focus on testing the adults who are more likely to be the ones carrying the disease. Uh, the second is kind of the opposite of that. Based on the epidemiological data, although there have been cases of children uh, who have gotten COVID-19, it tends to be less in the same, even within the same household as compared to adults. So by focusing on the adults, we believe by implication, we're also capturing the risk that any of the children may pose. Thank you. And I uh, Commissioner Johnson, did you want to weigh in on that or? No, I think Dr. Shaw covered it. Thank you. Um, and then my second question is, um, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about the, I believe the FDA has authorized at least one at-home self-swabbing test kit. Um, can you talk about the prevalence of these kits and the accuracy rate you're seeing? Um, it seems as though, you know, there, you, there might be some problems making sure people do it correctly at home and the, you know, making sure the kits don't yield false negatives. Sure. Uh, so, Kate, you know, one of the things that has evolved scientifically, another thing that has evolved scientifically really just in the past few weeks with COVID-19 is um, emerging data that show that um, the swabbing technique that can be used to get the sample need not necessarily be the nasopharyngeal swab. The nasopharyngeal swab is the one that goes pretty deep into your nose it feels like it's almost touching your brain. Those, of course, can be a little uncomfortable for folks. 
What has emerged are data to suggest that other swabbing techniques can be as effective or almost as effective as the nasopharyngeal technique. The self-swabbing technique, the self-swabbing kits that are on the market, uh, or the one that I believe to be on the market that has received FDA emergency use authorization, does not rely on the deep nasopharyngeal swab, but on a shorter swab. As a result, there's the thinking is that people will tolerate that and do that on their own better and more readily. Uh, we haven't seen really in Maine enough data to show or to demonstrate whether the accuracy is high or as high as the gold standard test that's done at our laboratory. I know that there are some groups that are working to collect those data, but certainly there's a trade-off here because self-swabbing, for example, doesn't require PPE, where the regular technique does. Self-swabbing may be more easily accessible, for example, for travelers who are thinking about coming to Maine as we talked about earlier. So there's definitely going to be a trade-off, and we're really looking to see what the data are in terms of the overall accuracy. Okay, and uh, so if, if somebody does a self-swab you know, kit, is that indicated somewhere in the test results then? You're aware of which ones are and are not self done at home? So if you typically, when a laboratory reads out the test, uh, it really does vary laboratory to laboratory based on whether the laboratory indicates how the specimen was collected. And different laboratories that, that run tests in different states may, may list whether it was from the back of the nose, the front of the nose, uh, other laboratories may not. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm gonna turn next to Steve Missler at Maine Public. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shaw. Um, just a quick clarification on the Abbott lab situation. Yeah, I think you mentioned that there's been five cases since uh, May 31st. Are those the are those all active cases? Whereas the ones you'd mentioned, the cumulative total uh, may not be correct. Uh, you are co you are correct as to the latter. As to the former, for the five cases, just trying to do the math. Um, I believe that all five are active cases. Um, but I, I will, we will confirm that, Steve. I uh, won't rely on my, my, uh, my shoddy uh, on-the-spot math skills. So I will, we'll confirm that for you and, and, and get you that answer just to make sure. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Um, and I guess my other question is just sort of a general one that I've picked up through conversations, through from acquaintances and readers, listeners, whatever. Uh, just a general sense of um, confusion and perhaps fatigue over the um, the changes that are being rolled out by the administration, whether it's on uh, the 14-day quarantine or uh, the reopening plan by the county, um, et cetera. Are you at all worried that people at some point will just become complacent or just uh, exhausted, frankly, about what's allowed, what isn't? Um, and that's just setting aside the question, I think, that you just fielded about masks or not masks, but um, asymptomatic uh, transmission or pre-symptomatic. I mean, there's just so much out there at this point that um, I've just been wondering if you're concerned that people just be uh, less compliant than they were in the early going of this. So I'll, I'll start and then again, Commissioner Johnson, if, if you'd like to weigh in by all means. Um, you know, Steve, I, th I think that's a concern. Um, there's, there's, there's certainly, we, we have to recognize the limits of human psychology. And um, there, there are only so many twists and turns and requirements that folks can abide. And, and we recognize that. It, it would be it, any, anyone who's tried to change their own behavior recognizes how hard that is, whether it's from starting an exercise regimen or adhering to a diet, changing behavior is really tough. But, but Steve, here's two things that I'll say. Uh, the first is what's truly been remarkable to me is how quickly folks did, in fact, change their behavior in response to the very real threat and concerns that were voiced around COVID-19. Um, I mean, the, the public health community has for 50 years, 70 years, been talking about smoking cessation and weight management and all sorts of things that we know to be uh, not great for the public's health. And we've moved the needle for sure. Seatbelt, smoking rates are down, seatbelt usage is up. But the extent to which the public health 
uh, the, the people across the country and in Maine change their behavior by staying inside, by now wearing face coverings in rapid time, we, we shouldn't forget that. Even as we think about the possibility of fatigue, we should not forget the fact that when called to help one another out in the state of Maine, people in Maine did so. And that's really impressive and important. Uh, we've all talked at these meetings about the, the data around how many, how much fewer people, how much less people were driving and how much less they were moving from their home. It's pretty remarkable. And honestly, I, I don't know of another instance in which so much behavior has changed for the common good in such a short period of time. But we also have to recognize that, of course, that we've, we've got to also start moving in a direction that allows people to get back to where they were before. Even though we are reopening, that's not going to be an immediate resumption of normal activity, but we are trying to balance those things uh, because we know that fatigue is real. So, Commissioner Johnson? Oh, I think you covered it, Dr. Shaw. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Steve. Uh, I'm going to turn next to Megan from WMTW. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Um, my question is about something you touched on earlier about the 101 recoveries since yesterday. I know that you uh, mentioned that the significant increase is largely because of a number of people that were associated with outbreaks now recovering, but we're, we're seeing that recovery number go up and active cases are kind of trending down. Um, is that all a function of the folks recovering from these outbreaks, or are we seeing any sort of beneficial outgrowth of testing, expanded testing and testing early of maybe those uh, pre-symptomatic folks that you, you've been discussing? So uh, Megan, great, great question. Um, and and um, the answer is that it's a bit of both. And I, I wish I could tell you on the sliding scale, uh, what percentage is A versus B. But but I will tell you that it is at least both of those two things, which is to say some very large outbreaks that we were contending with in the previous two to three weeks, where even though uh, a number of folks were affected, many were recovered. That's one thing that's, that's affected both of those numbers. But in the same time period, our overall case positivity rate has continued to trend downward, even as our number of tests has gone up all of which suggests that we're capturing more and more folks, potentially those who are asymptomatic. I don't know that for a fact, but that's what our models suggest might be happening. Now, how much of one versus the other is at play is a very difficult epidemiological question, and one that we may not really be able to fully answer until after the outbreak is over, and we sift through all the complete data that we've got at our disposal at that time. You know, the, the other piece that, Can that I is- I just ask a quick follow-up? Mm -hmm. Yep, go ahead, go ahead. Sorry, sorry about that. Um, my quick follow-up is just in regard to asymptomatic or I guess asymptomatic people. Um, what percentage of people are actually asymptomatic versus pre-symptomatic? I mean, do we have a figure on that? So if let's say you're pre like what, how many people go on to actually have symptoms? Right. So, Megan, um, it, it is, and, and you're right, it's, it's pre-symptomatic folks that we're really focused on. So here's, here's kind of how the numbers break down. The vast majority of individuals who have COVID-19, well over 85%, have symptoms at some point during their illness. What we also know is that a lot of folks get tested because of, the, uh, because of access to more widespread testing, a lot of folks are getting tested before they show symptoms. For example, close household contacts or individuals who work in higher risk settings. Of those individuals who, do, who get tested, who may not have any symptoms at the time of testing, they will eventually fall into that 80 to 85% who do develop symptoms. It really does depend on when in the course of their illness they get tested. What we also know to be true about COVID-19 is that a, uh, that a lot of the transmission can occur right around the time that people start showing symptoms. So even before someone has shown symptoms, they can transmit the disease. 
that again underscores why the face covering piece is so important. Uh, very good. Thanks, Megan. Uh, we are going to turn next to Maestro Don Kerrigan. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Shah. Uh, question, first of all, about uh, somewhat along the lines of what we talked about yesterday and you've talked about already, which is this added testing and its connection with uh, bringing back the current season. Are we really going to have enough robust testing readily available in the, especially in the prime tourist areas, so that anybody coming in from out of state can get tested easily, right away, quick results and all of that. I mean, that would seem to me require far more than say 4,000 tests a day. Uh, so Don, uh, I'll start and then again, Commissioner Johnson, the, the uh, please weigh in. The, the intention is for folks to get tested before uh, again, know before they go, know before they come to Maine what their COVID-19 status is. Testing is expanding not just in Maine, but across the country as well. Uh, other states may not have yet issued standing orders. They may not have stood up the same number of swab and send sites, but they are, they are coming online with their own more expanded testing regimes. And so we hope that almost all, as many as possible, surely, visitors to Maine will take advantage of that before they come to Maine. That allows them to avoid having to wait for their test result, basically allows them to come to Maine with their negative test and their certification form, uh, or with their certification form rather, and start enjoying Maine from the moment they get here, rather than waiting for a test result to come back. Commissioner Johnson? Yeah, no, absolutely, Dr. Shaw. I think you know what we are seeing and hearing from other states is that their testing capacity continues to increase as well. They are doing very similar things to what we are doing. So the expectation that capacity will grow across the Northeast very quickly um, or over the next few uh, next couple of weeks is, is high. All right. And Dr. Shah, the other question that I wanted to ask you uh, relates somewhat to the Abbott Labs and other outbreaks. Uh, you talked about wanting to trace it back to where it originated. Was it in the workplace? Was it outside contact? You said the same thing about the Chinbro outbreak. How many of these have you really been successfully able to trace back and figure out how did it get in? Where did it come from? So Don, um, in, there's a, you know, what we found is that workplace type outbreaks are unique and distinct from healthcare facility outbreaks. In healthcare facility outbreaks, uh, there's there's a better sense of who's in the facility at any one time, what their work schedule was, what wing they were on, which patients they interacted with. So in healthcare facility outbreaks, nursing homes, assisted living, uh, group homes, we have a much better ability to really zero in on how the outbreak may have been introduced and how it spread. In work sites, especially, for example, a construction site, with dozens, if not one hundreds of contractors coming in and out or a retail establishment with hundreds, if not thousands of people coming in every single day. The ability to trace down to where the outbreak may have been introduced and what the sites of transmission were is increasingly difficult. What we're doing right now with most of our workplace outbreaks though, is to focus on the shifts in which people worked. We try to line those shifts up to see whether the transmission patterns match when people were in the same rooms together. One of the things that Abbott, for example, has already done is to create flows within the facility. So folks are walking generally in the same direction, as you might have experienced if you've gone to a retail outlet or a grocery store lately. That also makes it a bit easier for us to see where people might have interacted and figure out whether they all happen to converge on Abbott or whether there was any transmission going there. Make no mistake, it's much harder in a workplace setting because if you think about your own workplace or at least the last time you were at your workplace, you pop in on someone's office to catch up with them. Maybe you have coffee with somebody else. Maybe you're in the elevator with a lot of people. Workplaces are by definition places where people come into contact with each other frequently. That's why workplaces are workplaces. 
Healthcare facilities are different. So certainly they're more challenging. But as we go through these, we look at as many data points as we can to try to get a handle on it. Quick, quick follow-up, if I might, please. In sure. regard to the healthcare facilities, the, a lot of the nursing home and congregate care, have you, have you been able to trace to the source of a lot of these? And has that uh, provided new information about how to control and prevent it from happening in others? Sure. In some healthcare facility outbreaks, we have been we have been able to identify, if not the first individual, but among the first cadre of folks who may have come into the facility and then led to further transmission. One of the key lessons learned from that is uh, the importance of doing um, uh, uh, well. First of all, the importance of things like universal use of masking and face coverings, even if people aren't feeling well. And then the other is what, what is called cohorting within the facility, which is to say trying to have the facility structured so a small number of healthcare workers takes care of the same small number of patients. That way, if there is an outbreak, it doesn't spread as far and wide, but rather uh, if it is introduced by a healthcare worker, the only folks that, the, the number of folks that they may infect is limited. So that cohorting has been something that we've been recommending, and that's a direct uh, piece of education or learning that we found, not just in Maine, but from talking to our colleagues across the country. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to turn next to Joe Lawler at the Press Herald. Hi, can you hear me? Yep, go ahead, Joe. Hi, uh, yes, thanks for uh, taking our questions. Um, I have two questions, one for Dr. Shaw and uh, one for Heather Johnson, Commissioner Johnson. Um, the question for Dr. Shaw, with Abbott, you mentioned Abbott uh, started testing weekly back in April. And, you know, considering that uh, your testing capacity at the state is much greater and then will be even greater starting in July, um, what do you think about, you know, having uh, assisted living centers, um, congregate care facilities, or maybe even some workplaces do surveillance testing before there's even a positive case? I know that's something you've thought about. Is it, what, what is your thinking on that now in light of the new testing capacity? Uh, Joe, as, as you noted, it's, it's been something that we've been thinking about, particularly focused on healthcare facilities with vulnerable populations, long-term care facilities and assisted living facilities, first and foremost. Uh, we've been working on it for um, a, a while, very intensely, especially now in light of two developments. The first is the expanded testing capacity at our lab. The second is the standing order. Uh, one of the challenges that we have to think through before we make the first move on the chessboard is staffing. If a facility, if we test everyone in a facility, specifically the staff, and a large number test positive, uh, it's good we've uncovered that. That's great from an epidemiological perspective, but we have to simultaneously make sure that the facility has a staffing plan in place because those staff members, of course, will need to be out of work. We are putting the, we're, we're very, very close to launching uh, a pilot to start this process with some long-term care facilities in counties of high community transmission. Um, we're very close, but you're right. It's something we've been thinking about. Um, but as if folks have heard me talk about at these meetings, I don't like to make the first move on the chessboard until we've thought through the last move. So it, it sounds like it's just a logistical question, really not, not a whether we should be doing it. Yeah, correct, 100%. Early on, correct. And, and that's honestly always what it's been. It's never been a whether, it's been a how, specifically a what if type of how. What if we find significant numbers of staff members who test positive? We don't want to be running around at that point, working the phones to try to find staff who can, who can pinch hit. We need to have a plan in place the moment we get the results. Okay, my question, thank you. And my question for uh, Commissioner Johnson is, uh, so for people who, for Maine residents, if you're a Maine resident and you um, go out of state, say on vacation to New York State or wherever the case may be, and, and then you're, you're, you know, you're, you're gone for a week or so and then you come back in, do you need to also need to get a, uh, a negative test result within 72 hours of returning to the state of Maine? And if that's the case, uh, what is the reasoning behind that? So we still have an executive order that requires quarantine as people leave the state and come back. Um, unless they are doing essential work, there, there is a quarantine order. 
Um, and now there's an alternative to the quarantine, which is testing. So they would then re require, um, if you're a main resident and you leave and come back, then you would need to either quarantine or have a test just to That's correct. understand you. Okay, thank you. Again, uh, New we, Hampshire and Vermont, travel to New Hampshire and Vermont would be excluded. Right. Uh, we're gonna turn now to Amy Brown from WERU. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Uh, does Maine have the capacity now to restock testing as quickly as we're going to be using the testing kit? So uh, in other words, will we still have sufficient supplies if there's a spike in the fall or during flu season, especially if we do start testing a lot of people coming in from out of state over the summer? Uh, the, the simple answer to your question, Amy, is yes. Um, one of the reasons that our partnership with IDEX has been so beneficial for the people of Maine is that IDEX being a major leader in diagnostic testing equipment has a very extensive and deep capacity to supply the state with uh, really a, just an extraordinarily high number of testing kits. So whereas previously we and in other states to this day had been, had been reliant upon the US CDC for furnishing us with testing kits, our, our independence and in striking the deal with IDEX means that our capacity to continue testing throughout the summer and into the fall and winter months uh, should continue unabated. Great, and if we don't see a spike in cases in the next few weeks following all the mass gatherings that have been happening here in the past few weeks, as well as the influx of people from other, other states, will you possibly rethink your recommendations about the size of gatherings so that we can allow fairs and concerts and larger gatherings to take place using social distancing, wearing face coverings into the rest of the summer and the fall? So Amy, I, I can't speculate on what those data might look like, let alone how we might interpret them. Uh, no two gatherings are the same. And so what we would really want to do is take a look at not just the data from the state of Maine, but data from gatherings that have occurred over the past several months across the country. There are some early data, very early data, based on a single paper coming out of Germany which suggested that individuals who had gone to a carnival type event in Germany did have an increased risk for COVID-19. Um, so we really do need to wait until all the data are in and not make decisions based on small data sets. We're always looking at data from across the globe, from the US CDC, from, our, from the experience in other states. Um, and based on what we see from those data, depending on what the science says, that's where we go. Um, similar to how we thought about other things, it's the data, not the date. Thank you. I'm going to turn next to David Horowitz from ABC7. Yes, thank you. I had a question. Is there fun, uh, federal funding available for people that don't have insurance, whether they get tested or treated? How does that work? Sure, um, I'll, I'll take this one and then we can get you further details, David. But the bottom line is that the state of Maine independently, uh, as well as in concert with our colleagues at the federal government, has provided different mechanisms for individuals who are uninsured or underinsured to make sure that their COVID-19 test can be covered. Okay. Yep. Uh, I'm gonna turn next to Randy Whitehouse from the Sun Journal. Uh, good afternoon, Dr. Shaw, thank you. Uh, my question is a little bit more narrow, kind of a follow-up on what Amy asked. Uh, the, uh, the auto racing tracks here in the state uh, say that they've uh, tried to uh, uh, submit some uh, opening proposals so that they could have races uh, this year and have either been uh, rejected or they haven't received a response. Uh, do you foresee main R racing tracks uh, being able to hold races this year? Uh, do you see them being able to hold races with fans this year? And what would tracks need to be able to do in order to open safely this year? Commissioner Johnson, I'll, I'll let you uh, address that one. Yeah, so uh, thank you for the question. Um, we have been 
looking at um, a couple of different uh, speedways that send in information around their grandstand spaces and and um, infield spaces and others. You know, I think obviously we want to support as much expansion as quickly as possible. Um, sports is a category and professional um, sports like this are is a category that is on the docket. It just has been pushed out. Um, we are reviewing those now, looking at things like, you know, traffic flows, number of people. There's just a discussion about gatherings um, to try to figure out, is there, a, is there a way and what would that way be? Um, all of these um, situations for those types of work are very individual and customized. And so there wouldn't be like a sector look at it. Likely each speedway would need um, a specific set of um, look at protocols and and traffic flows and those types of things. I think, right, there are some concerning points there around the number of people that fans that would normally go to a speedway and activity that happens there. Um, so we, uh, Commissioner Van Oat has offered to kind of help us look at that in partnership with the public health team. So um, we expect to have more feedback on that uh, coming shortly. Thanks, Randy. And the last question for this afternoon goes to Patrick Whittle from the AP. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I had two things. Um, according to my notes, which could be wrong, which is why I'm asking this question, um, the state of civil emergency, I think, is scheduled to be over on Thursday. And I'm curious if there's been a decision about extending that and what extending it or not extending it could mean uh, for this new testing protocol um, and in, in terms of visitors. And also, did I hear correctly that if people from uh, New Hampshire or Vermont leave their states and then attempt to come into Maine, they will be exempted from the protocol? But if Maine residents do that, they won't be? Because that's what it sounded like. But common sense tells me that's not what it is. Sure. Um uh, so as to the former, I know there's discussions underway, Patrick, uh, at the governor's office around the dates and the extensions. We'll get you further details on that. And as to the latter, I'll turn it over to Commissioner. Uh, yeah, so um, what we did was we allowed people from Vermont and New Hampshire to come into Maine without um, either testing or quarantine. And what we're saying is if you're a Maine resident and you go visit Vermont or New Hampshire, oh. you can come back without either a test or a quarantine as well. Um, I think maybe Patrick, that was the, where the yeah. confusion was. That, that's what I misunderstood. Thank you very much. Yeah. Great, great. Thanks, Patrick. All right. Well, again, I'd like to thank Commissioner Johnson for joining this afternoon. Dr. Thibodeau, thank you as always for being with us. And I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in this afternoon to hear the latest on COVID-19. We ask everyone to stay safe, stay healthy. We look forward to chatting soon. Thank you very much. Have a good afternoon.